Hey, hey, my math-loving brethren. I have a long overdue video that I wanted to do back in April. It was my problem of the month that I did for my students back then. Getting to it now, whoops. So without further ado, let's take a look at the problem that I challenged my students to look at. So uh, find the domain of each function below and guess the pattern with the restriction. So here you see a total of four different functions. And they all have this kind of cool related effect with one another. So if we look at f of x, for example, it's just 1 over x minus 1. Uh, nothing too special there. But when we look at g of x, notice my color coding. It's going to be 1 over, well, this is where it gets kind of tricky, uh, 1 over x minus 1 minus 1. So the idea is actually quite simple. You just take f of x and you stick it into place here. So really, g of x is 1 over f of x minus 1. And this idea keeps going and going and going. So if you look at h of x, it's going to be 1 over, 1 over, 1 over x minus 1 minus 1 minus 1. Fun stuff right there. Dare I even try j of x? 1 over, 1 over, 1 over, 1 over, x minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. I, don't, I've lost, I lost track of the minus 1s at this point. You get the idea. It has this uh, 12 days of Christmas-like effect. 12 days of Christmas, you know, you got that. Uh, and 5 golden rings, 4, don't know what happens at 4, 3, French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. You now you have to keep repeating it after every day, right? It's the same thing, uh, but with fractions, right? Making a reference to Christmas with fractions. Uh, huh. So the classic case of a fraction and a fraction and a fraction and a fraction, fraction occurring at you just when you thought math was um, hard enough. Uh, we put a fraction in your fraction because we heard you like fractions, dog. So this idea, by the way, can keep going and going and going. Uh, that concept is called a continued fraction, if you want to further look into that. All right, so the objective is to find the domain of each function and to maybe discover a pattern that comes into play. Spoiler alert, there's a pattern that comes into play. Without further ado, so f of x over here, incredibly straightforward. If I asked you, what is the single number that you can never divide by? Your response should be unanimously zero. And that's exactly what I did here. I set the denominator equal to zero with rational functions. Um, really, all real numbers are game, are fair game, except for when your denominator just so happens to work out to be zero. In this situation right here, we have x minus 1 in the denominator. When you set that equal to zero, you know, you're finding the instance when it is equal to zero. A simple addition of 1 to both sides will lead you with a restriction at the number 1. It's every real number but the number 1. Straightforward enough. So let's keep going here. Time to look at g of x. With g of x, it's the same idea. You have to figure out when your denominator is uh, you know, equal to 0, and that's, that's a bad thing. You don't want to ever divide by 0, um, and, and you, you solve for that instance. So uh, what I did was I took that whole denominator, and I set it equal to 0. Uh, this time around, you do have to play around with some ideas, um, like LCD and such. So I moved over the 1. I, I noticed the x minus 1 in this denominator. I distributed it in an x minus 1 to get rid of that nasty denominator. I got a value of 2. I'll spare you the trouble on that one. But here's the thing. We still have f of x inside of g of x to some extent, right? We have that um, in, in red here. We have that 1 over x minus 1. We still have to consider that denominator, too, because you can't stick a 0 in there or in here. Uh, so you have to look for both instances where it, it gets a little trippy. We already did the work for red, though. We did the work for f of x. We, we already found that it can't be 1. And, um, and as we, we see here, I just did the work for now g of x, that whole denominator, and I got 2. So now I have every real number except 1 and 2. All right, I want you to start thinking if there's a pattern coming in play here. It's a little hard to find a pattern with only two numbers, so yeah, I'll tell you right now, your guess will probably be wrong. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a fun game, so just start conjecturing right now. Okay, so this is where it starts to look like a soup of symbols. Uh, but the idea is still the same. You can't have a zero in the denominator, but this time around, how many of the denominators do you have? Well, we had one in the first case, we had two in the second case, we now have three in the third case. That's what we're dealing with here. Um, so what you see in red and in green, we already did those. We, we saw that you couldn't be one, couldn't be two. Those are both listed there. Um, however, we didn't find uh, that, that new uh, instance where in h of x, now you have that you know, third uh, sort of larger denominator there. Uh, you do have to solve for that instance, which is a little messy now. Um, so I went ahead, set it equal to 0, or you know, not equal to 0 to find that instance. Uh, moved over the 1, multiplied in the LCD, 
Uh, and then it, it's still he's still the fraction, right? Because you had two fractions and you broke well one of them, and so now you still have one remaining. When you distribute in that denominator into both your terms, there uh, you end up getting one is well not equal to one over uh, x minus one, and then still that minus one. Swing that one over, and it sort of turns into this fun game. I actually encourage you to sort of work these out on your own, and then verify against my work here. Um, you then have to multiply that denominator in once more, and uh, sure enough, the math at that point becomes fairly algebra one -y. Uh You end up distributing a 2 to x minus uh, 1. Uh, the x minus 1's cancel to the right there. Uh, you swing the 2 over, divide by your coefficient, that is 2, and this time around you're going to get 3 halves. Maybe not what you guessed before. There is still a pattern here. I want you to conjecture again before I reveal the last restriction for j of x. Okay, disclaimer, we are now at a point of full ridiculousness. Um, I didn't even have the room on the board here to reproduce what I already found with the other uh, fractions, h of x, um, g of x, and, and f of x. So all I had the room for here was to find that case where uh, j of x's denominator um, it, you know, is zero. Um, sure enough, required a whole ton of math. Uh, you end up multiplying in the denominator uh, three separate times. Uh, I'm going to spare the explanation here and, and hope you can trust my math on this one. I end up getting a value of five-thirds. Five-thirds is a restriction, uh, that additional restriction that j of x offers. So now I have one, two, three-halves, and five-thirds. There's a pattern here. I have to admit, when I first did this problem, I was like, man, after one, two, and three halves, I thought I had it down pat. I thought the next one would be, I don't know, like um, four thirds or something like that. Or um, I, I don't know. I saw something with the twos in play and, and was a little stumped when I got five thirds. I even had to type it into Wolfram Alpha, but I'm assuring you right now it is five thirds. And if we keep going, well, let me show you what would happen if we kept going. All right, so if you chose to, for whatever reason, keep going with this continued fraction idea, um, these would be then your, your next restrictions. Now, there's a pattern. There's a pattern. There's a pattern. I want you to maybe pause the video and uh, open up the Jeopardy, kind of Final Jeopardy music, right? Isn't that that one that goes dun 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 Yeah, and, and try to just think of it on your own. Uh, I'm about to reveal the answer here, but it's funner to discover patterns on your own. Okay, for real this time, next uh, cut, I'm gonna have the answer, so pause now. Okay, here comes the answer. Okay, the big reveal, if you strategically rewrite one as one over one, because the rest are fractions, why not make one a fraction? And if you strategically rewrite two as two over one, it actually becomes a little bit more clear if you're familiar with the notion of the Fibonacci sequence. So the Fibonacci sequence is, uh, is a sequence of numbers that, that essentially states that every number after the first two, and the first two are just one and one, is the sum of the two uh, preceding ones. So like, okay, we start with one and one. What's the sum of one and one? Well, it's two. Okay, so if we move into the next one, what's the sum of one and two? That's three. Okay, what's the sum of two and three? That's five. What's the sum of three and five? That's eight, and so on. Uh, as you can see here, it kind of snakes its way into um, our domain restrictions of that continued fraction that we were really looking at. So here we see the 1 over 1, which is the first two terms in the Fibonacci sequence. Here we see that 2 over 1, which is the second two terms, or you know, i got to be careful here, it's the uh, second and third term of our Fibonacci sequence. Here we see 3 over 2, which is now the um, third and fourth term, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now this gets even cooler, believe it or not. All right, so the even cooler aspect of this uh, sort of continued fraction domain-esque problem here. It really, uh, we sort of spiraled out of control uh, from what the problem initially was, that's for, for certain, uh, is if we take a look at the numbers, it's not exactly the Fibonacci sequence, it's actually the ratio of numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, where we have um, a term over the prior term. And if you know anything about the Fibonacci sequence, uh, there's a certain pattern that comes into play with that, uh, we start with 1, we move up to 2, we head back down to 1.5, then we head back up to 1.67, then we head back down to 1.6, it kind of oscillates, and it converges to a very special number. That very special number is approximately 1.618. That very special number is this thing. 
the squiggle thing. Yeah, that's that's it. That's all I have for you guys. No, I'm, I'm kidding. This squiggle thing is actually really important. He's the golden ratio, hence the golden color, which I didn't do on purpose. This thing's called phi. And phi, he is, uh, he's otherwise known as the golden ratio. Uh, it is the golden standard for rectangles. The ideal, the perfect, the cutest rectangle has a ratio of its length to its width of approximately phi. All right, guys, so I went ahead and I'm not... I'm not going to do anything fancy here. I Google image searched golden ratio. And as we can see, we see all these fancy spirals that have to do with the numbers that we just kind of explored, right? We looked at the Fibonacci sequence, and sure enough, we see the Fibonacci sequence in this sort of spiral, uh, otherwise known as the Fibonacci spiral uh, going on here. Let's take a look at a, a rectangle with the golden ratio in play. Here we have it. We see this length to its width. We have that perfect phi-like ratio. Isn't that just a fancy, just pristine-looking rectangle? Uh, all right, I, I agree. It's kind of self-indulgent to say, oh, this is the most perfect rectangle because math. Uh, I'm with you there. Um, but it's supposed to be most pleasing to the eye. I, I mean, if we take a look at, like, aspect ratios for like movies and stuff it's approximately phi you can play around with this spiral with this ratio in, in a lot of fun and obviously very creative ways um, so we see a lot of these ratios in uh, play in human structure the, fa the you know structure of human faces um, in flowers I've seen that a lot I, I, I think there's a shell earlier here yeah this is like a nautilus shell you can see the golden spiral uh, it's, it's just fun. You can play around with this idea in architecture as well. Um, and I guess apparently in the galaxy, that's, that's wild. Uh, and the Mona Lisa. Cool. All right. Well, you, you can have fun clicking around with this. I, I'm, I'm done here. But as you can see here, the golden ratio has, um, you know, whether you think it's a hoax or not, it has some cultural significance. Kind of crazy how that showed up in the domain of a continued fraction. Or maybe it's not. Okay, so I just went around the house with a ruler measuring things because what else do math teachers do over their summer break? And I found, uh, I found some items with uh, the golden ratio in play. So here is a uh, photo that my girlfriend got me. It's a, um, a U of I's is my alma mater. Uh, and sure enough, the ratio of its length to its width is approximately phi. Um, here is a, a tablet, a Motorola Zoom tablet. And again, this ratio of its, of its length to its width is approximately phi. The board that I was using all along has a, a, a ratio of approximately phi as well. So isn't that wild? All right, well, that's that's all I have for you. I'm done measuring things around my house. Uh, cool stuff. I hope you continue mathing on, and I will do the same. I will see you in the next video.